So I think we're going to go ahead and get started here. It's a little bit past six. Um, so thank you all for coming out today. Um, we're, oh, remind me, yes. Um, so just so you know, this is for um, Fact TV's recording. It's not meant to project. There's no speaker system in here. So if I'm if I'm too quiet, just let me know and I'll speak up. Um, the microphone won't help. <laughs> um, so today we're here to talk about the Burn Pond Retrofit Project. Um, I'm Claudia Guy. I'm the environmental engineer for the city of Fitchburg. And we have Corey Horton here with R.A. Smith. You might recognize him because he's a previous director of public works for the city of Fitchburg. And he's worked on this project before. So we're glad to have him here helping us with this project. Um, and if you have any questions as we go along, feel free to stop me and we can, you know, talk about things. You don't have to hold your questions to the end. So today we're going to uh, go over just a little bit of background information. I know in our, in our meetings last year we covered a lot of background information, so this is going to be a really quick overview of a couple key concepts. Um, we're going to talk about project progress in 2019 and some of the obstacles that we faced in 2019. Um, we're going to go over funding sources and some developments that we have had there, um, which are very excited, um, exciting. Um, and then we're going to talk about the proposed design, which is a little bit different, uh, improved, vastly improved from what we uh, talked about last year because as we'll discuss later, we have additional funding sources, so we have more available to have a better project here. So I think, I think this is going to be a very positive change in the design, but we'll go ahead and go over that and get your thoughts on it. Um, and then uh, just a little bit uh, of what, what to expect in terms of timeline here. So background information of the Burnwood neighborhood was developed in 1988, and it was, uh, or sorry, it was platted in 1988 and built in the following years. Um, some of the land was dedicated to the public for park purposes, and that's the Burn Park. And then just to the south of that, there's a parcel there that was dedicated to the public for stormwater purposes, um, and that's that's the parcel that we're talking about today, and that's where this retrofit is going to occur. So the area that drains to um, the pond, which uh, I'm calling it a pond because it's, it's a dry pond, uh, which means that it, it allows water to build up in the pond, but then it, it becomes dry between rain events. So it's not a traditional pond that you think of that's wet all the time. Um, it's a dry pond, um, and this is the area that drains to it. Um, it was built to meet 1998 stormwater requirements. And at the time, there was only a detention requirement. So the pond is designed to allow water to build up into, in the pond and then release the water more slowly. Um, but the pond wasn't designed for things that we would design to today, um, such as um, infiltration, reducing the volume that goes downstream, cleaning the water a little bit before it goes downstream, um, getting rid of uh, suspended solids, litter, um, and oil and grease and that kind of thing before we send it downstream. Um, so the project goals are really to try to um, make this pond do more for us within the same footprint. Um, so we are trying to improve the water quality that we're sending downstream and reduce the amount of water um, by increasing infiltration and evapotranspiration from what the plants in that area are going to take up and then um, evapotranspirate into the air. Um, we're also, another goal is to try to capture trash and litter on the um, public property, so that's something that the city can maintain um, rather than downstream property owners. Um, and another goal is to reduce the erosive velocities that are leaving uh, this, this area. Uh, the way we're planning to do that is to install uh, a bioretention basin. And the way a bioretention basin works um, is it kind of, one of the key concepts is that there are different soil layers beneath the surface of the earth. Um, and some of those layers are more infiltrative than others. So if you have a clay layer, it will tend to 
keep water from infiltrating at all. And so those permanent wet ponds that I talked about in the future, they usually have a clay liner. And that means that it really, really reduces the rate at which water can infiltrate. And that's essentially what we have in burn pond today is it's very clay soil. So not a whole lot of infiltration occurring. Um, so what we would do is we would uh, dig down in and remove those low infiltrative soils um, into until we reach a layer where we, we do have higher infiltration. Um, and we would replace that with a higher infiltrative material. Um, and that would encourage water to infiltrate in that area. Um, and typically, bioretention basins are designed to allow temporary ponding. Um, and they should be infiltrating within 48 hours. So within two days um, is what we would design the bioretention basin to do. Um, this is just a typical layout for a bioretention basin. Um, if, if you were to install a rain guard in your, in your home, um, that's another word that folks use uh, for bioretention basins, but uh, this is kind of a, a home application, but the same concepts apply. So you can see the downspout or the water source um, comes in, and then you might have a berm on the downstream side to try to capture the water in that area and allow it to pool a little bit and then infiltrate. Um, but and then you would also have native plantings in that area which have deeper roots and use more water than, say, turf or weeds. Um, so in 2019, um, the goal in 2019 was to build this project and we ran into quite a few obstacles. Um, so I did want to kind of just explain what, what, we, what we ran into in 2019. Um, so in March of 2019, we had our first public meeting, and I believe many of you were there at that one as well. Um, and we kind of, we introduced uh, this project and talked about um, the goals of the project and then also got feedback from the community just to see what folks were really looking for in this area. One of the things that we heard, um, one of the big concerns uh, was uh, folks didn't really want to see a permanent pool of water. Um, there were safety concerns and also mosquito concerns with that. Um, so that's something that we took seriously and incorporated into our design. Um, another thing that we heard is just really wanting to reduce the amount of water that goes downstream. Um, and that's something that we're trying to maximize within this area as much as we can. Um, and then also there was just a desire to have um, a beautiful space with native plantings. Um, and, and that is something that we feel aligns very well with our goal of um, improving water quality and improving infiltration and evapotranspiration. So I think that's something that we can all um, enjoy out of this space once it's, once it's complete. Um, so that was the first public meeting. Um, and then we went to the drawing board and then came up with a design um, that we thought met uh, the desires of the community. Um, and we had another public meeting to talk about what that design was going to look like. Um, and uh, that meeting was in May. Um, and from there, we, we went and we actually put together um, design documents and bid documents, um, which are something that you can post and then have people bid on. Um, so we posted the project in June of 2019, um, advertised it twice in the Wisconsin State Journal, and then also sent an email to contractors um, who have bid on these types of projects in the past uh, just to generate interest and um, try to get folks to bid on this project. Um, in July, uh, on the due date, we unfortunately only received one bid, um, which was pretty disappointing uh, for us. Um, and the city has a policy that if you only receive one bid, you don't open it. So um, there's not considered to be enough competition. So, um, so we didn't open it. Um, and then we rebid it two days later. Um, and we did, the we did the same thing and then added a few steps. So we advertised it again in the Wisconsin State Journal twice, um, emailed all of the contractors, and then followed up with phone calls to everyone to make sure any questions that they had were answered and to just verbally get them familiar with the project, the location, the design goals, what we were looking for, all of that. Um, and in July, we again only received one bid, which was disappointing. Um, but we talked to the city administrator and said, hey, you know, this is 
pretty late in the season now. I think we're only getting one bid, and it's not because of it's not because we haven't told enough people. It's because everyone's busy at this point. Everyone has projects going on. Um, so with the city administrator's permission, we opened that bid, um, and it was $440,000, um, which was well above the engineer's estimate and also well above the budget of the project of 150K. Um, so with uh, the staff recommendation was to reject that bid, and that's what council ultimately decided to do. Um, so after that, we went back to the drawing board, really reduced the scope of the project, um, and reposted it in August um, in hopes that we would get a bid that was within budget. Um, so we posted it in August, advertised it, sent the emails. I made all of the same phone calls, and then actually the city administrator made phone calls to his contacts, and the city engineer also made phone calls to his contacts just to make sure we weren't missing anyone um, in that round. And we only received one bid in August of 2019. It was, again, over budget, and at that point, it was kind of a question of, we've reduced the scope of this project so much, how valuable is it really going to be? And it's also well above the engineer's estimate, so we're kind of spending a lot of you know, taxpayer dollars on a project that really isn't going to um, achieve the goals that we set forth. So just as a reminder, kind of at the end of 2019, this is what we were looking at. Um, we were leaving the concrete flume in place. Um, there was an alternate to maybe seed with native seeding north of the flume. Um, we were going to have seeding south of that flume and then have one small bioretention area. Um, oops. And that, I mean, this was kind of a disappointing place to end, um, and that's kind of what the budget was directing us to because we had to keep on scaling back this project um, into something that was in in budget um, so so in a way i'm i'm kind of glad that this did not go forward because over the winter um, over the winter we, you know we really had some conversations with um, a lot of folks to try to get ideas on you know, what we can do to make this project happen. Um, and one of the most exciting um, conversations that I had was with uh, Dane County um, and basically explained the situation and said, you know, we're getting these really, really high, um, really high bids on this project. Um, and it doesn't seem like we're really going to be able to achieve something that great for all of this money. Um, and what he told me is that Dane County would be, in, if we applied for a, an increased grant, Dane County would be interested in giving us a grant. So that was, that was exciting news. Um, so uh, just to go over the original funding and budget of this project, um, so several years ago, staff rec recommended this project. Um, and in 2017, um, Common Council approved incorporating 150K um, into the capital improvement fund for this project. Um, and then staff secured grants from DNR for 32K and then another grant from Dane County for um, $82,500 um, to cover a portion of the cost of the project. But the, the entire goal at this point was that the total project budget would still be 150k and that the grants were just going to supplement some of that some of that cost um, and so what we're what we're planning at this point is um, first of all Dane County um, is able to offer a grant of up to 182k because they're they're able to offer a grant up to half of the total project cost not half of what the city puts forward it's half of the total project cost so that would also include the dnr funding that we secured um, so so that's where that 182,325k is coming from um, and then um, 
what staff is proposing is that since the stormwater utility is only going to pay 150k um, and all of this other money is going to be given to us um, we are going to be proposed that the total project budget actually be increased to three hundred sixty four thousand um, dollars as opposed to 150k which is what was originally um, which was originally set aside for this project um, and I, I do have two caveats to this. One is that um, I have verbally been told that we should expect that Dane County grant to come through, um, but that is something we are still working on the paperwork. I've just been told, you know, we submitted it a while ago and it just takes time for the official paperwork to come through. Um, so, so that's not official yet, but that's what we're moving forward with, with the design and what we're planning to do. Um, and then the other caveat to this is um, staff, we can't just change the budget to this. Um, we would need to get a budget amendment for that through council. But since, since we're not changing what the city is putting into it, I, at least the staff feels we've talked about this internally and we feel that that's not going to be hard to get common council to agree to because that's not increasing the, the taxpayer input into this. So, so we think that there are a couple caveats, but, but this is what we're going forward with. Um, and this, having this very increased budget has given us um, a lot more opportunity to do more with this project, which is exciting. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Corey, who's going to go over uh, the proposed design. All right, thanks, Claudia. So um, as Claudia mentioned, I'm with R.A. Smith. Um, the city hired my firm basically to kind of with that increased budget to take a look at everything and to assist the city in putting together the bidding documents, the plans and the specifications um, for a project that can do as much as possible within the budget that we have um, available. So as Claudia said, it's very exciting to kind of see the project go from that really reduced scope into something that, that will really kind of accomplish what those initial goals were for everyone. So um, with the budget, we've um, jumped into kind of the design and, and what we think would be the, the best fit for achieving those water quality and quantity um, benefits, um, again, within that existing footprint of um, the the stormwater um, outlot that is is located there. Um, so this is the the design. There's three major components to it. There is a dry forebay on your right. Then there's a filter strip in the middle, and then there's that bioretention basin um, on the left side. So um, on the right side, it's towards the east, and on the left side, it's towards the west. So um, those three components are, are doing different functions that dry forebay with native plantings is a place for sediment to drop out of the stormwater that's entering the facility. We want to make sure that we have a place where we capture the sediment where it can be easily maintained and where it doesn't get into the engineered soil that we're going to put downstream because it would plug it up. So that provides us a place where we can capture the sediment and um, easily uh, maintain it. Um, moving further down, there's the filter strip. So that is basically a, a native planted um, way to convey the water across the site. Um, so I'll have a picture later on in the presentation what that would look like. Um, but like Claudia had mentioned before, um, there was a strong desire of everyone to to get this area looking nice, to get natives planted in the entire basin. So that's kind of what um, the filter strip accomplishes. Um, the filter strip is is effective. Um, you know, it's deep rooted native vegetation, which does a nice job of um, removing those pollutants, of slowing the water down, and of improving water quality. And then finally, on the left, we have that bioretention basin that, that Claudia nicely explained how we're kind of getting down to those sand layers to get as much water to go into the ground as we can versus kind of having that um, clay layer that, that plugs everything off. So that's where we address the water volume, which is going downstream. So instead of water going over the surface, it will go into that nice sand layer and soak into the ground and decrease the volume of water that goes off into the farm field and cause, causes erosion and problems downstream. So on this exhibit, you'll also see another, um, and I'll go through a lot of the details of it, but just so you kind of know where they're at um, in plan view, you'll see um, 
I guess first of all, on the downstream side of the dry four bay, there is what's called a level spreader. Um, there's, that's located in three different locations, and basically what that is is it's a hard point to prevent the bottom of the basin from getting eroded down. So in general, um, those have uh, rock-filled baskets, so it will be placed at grade, so at the ground surface, and those rock baskets will keep the ground from, the water from digging out the ground and, and causing erosion downstream. And I'll show you a picture of that, which will make much more sense later. There's also, um, you'll see the area where it says bypass pipes and sump. There is um, going to be a, a catch basin and a pipe system with a back pitch pipe, which will assist in capturing some of the sediment, which will provide a place where the city can come in with their vacuum truck and vacuum the sediment out, um, rather than um, needing to completely scoop out all of the native vegetated area. So that's just to ease the city's long-term maintenance. Any questions so far? No. Are you taking out that center concrete strip? Yes, so the entire um, concrete flume is planned on coming out. The structures coming in on the inlet side and the outlet side will remain as they are right now, but the concrete flume is expected to fully come out. And then where you're putting the blue um, level spreaders, is that kind of like a little waterfall then? No, they're actually right at the ground surface. Okay. So. Probably in a year or two, you won't even be able to tell they're there because they're only three feet wide. And then there'll be native vegetation right up next to it that will grow to where you'll have a hard time even finding them unless you're walking right on top of them. So here's kind of a, a, a slice through the center of it so you can kind of see what it looks like. Again, starting at the right, all of this basin slopes um, to the outlet. So we have that dry four bay. We have um, um, I guess the, the dry four bay will be built up. This, this one will be a, f um, a foot and a quarter higher than the ground surface. So this one has an earthen berm that's a little bit taller, again, to get that sediment to drop out here. Those other level spreaders that are, are downstream here and then down by the bioretention here, those are the ones that are at grade. This one will be slightly above grade for the berm, but the level spreader is actually at the toe of the berm right at the ground there. But you will see there will be a little bit of a, almost like a little speed bump, um, just to provide a place for that water to pool for the sediment to drop out in the dry four bay area. Is that like the one that we had in there before? Um, this will be constructed out of earth. So it's just a very gentle, again, only a foot and a quarter high. So once that vegetation grows, you will have a hard time seeing that. So this is what that dry four bay looks like. Um, I guess I'll stand up here some more. Um, so again, we have a series of, of inlets and then a pipe. This is that maintenance inlet where the city can come in and vacuum out the sediment. That then lets the water pass through. On the downstream end, we have that rock-filled basket, which will help that water to spread out over the basin. And then there's also what's called stone weepers and, and, and gabion weepers. So the water building up in here has a few different flow paths that it can take. And we wanted to provide a redundant design. So if one of these devices gets plugged, it has another mechanism to still function. So water can either come in, go through this pipe, and, and go through. It can also build up and go through these stone weepers. And then in larger events, this is a, an, that earthen berm, the speed bump that I talked about, where the water will just go over the top of that into the, into the swale and downstream. Does that make sense to everyone? OK. So um, the dry four bay, and actually the entire basin is going to be vegetated with native plantings. And um, Mike Anderson put together all of the, the plant lists for that, and um, we've taken a look at that. We think he did a fantastic job on it, so uh, kudos to him, and thank you for, for putting that together. So that's the seed mix that we're planning on using out there. So it will have, um, you know, a, 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 a lot of different types of native vegetation flowers, and, and it, it will, in my opinion, it looks beautiful. I, I love how this looks. Not everyone shares that same opinion, though. Um, but um, I, I love how um, the native vegetation looks, and I think, I think most of you are very uh, environmentally uh, minded and will like how that looks as well. 
So this is very similar to how I would expect that 4-bay to look. So at the downstream end of the 4-bay, we have that speed bump earth and berm with the Gabion weepers and then the um, level spreader on the downstream end. So go to the next one. And here's what that looks like in a little bit clearer plan view so you can see what's going on. So this is that earthen berm which will go across the whole basin. It's only a, a foot and a quarter high, so it's pretty shallow. On the face of it, there's um, rock and then there's rock-filled baskets. So the water can seep through here at a slower rate. So this, because this restricts the water from going through very quickly, it allows the sediment to drop out on the upstream side. Inside of these baskets, we're also going to put some capped pipes. So if this ever fails and we need a mechanism to dry this thing down, we can pull the caps. And it also provides if we need to do maintenance, we can take the caps off to dry it out while we do maintenance as well. This whole berm will also have um, uh, an erosion control blanket on it to protect it from erosion, and that will be keyed into this rock-filled basket on the toe, which will protect it as well. Any questions on this? Is that going to be engineered soil or our good clay stuff? No, this this we don't want to be permeable. So this will be a more clay berm um, just for this section. Question. Yep. How long will it take to dissipate the foot and a half that's in the first spot that's left there? We, like eight, two days? Uh, we looked at that and in general, it should be less than six hours for that oh. foot and a half. Beautiful. So it's, it should be relatively quick. So uh, here's a slice through it looking the other way. Again, your water would enter here, it would go through this rock, then it would go through the stone basket, through this rock, and then out onto that level spreader. So it provides a nice smooth mechanism for the water to get through. Um, but again, it makes it pond a little bit to get that sediment to drop out. So we put, you see these yellow areas. We didn't do the rock-filled baskets all the way across because this rock over time will get plugged up and will need to be maintained. So we have filter fabric on the outside and then this rock will be placed. So this is an area that can also be maintained by the city long term. So they, if this is getting plugged up, they can come in here, scoop the rock off, put new rock back on and we're, we're back functioning again. And again, here's kind of a, just another view of what it looks like with that water coming through. This would be that vegetated swale. This would be the next level spreader and then getting down into the bioretention. This is a cross section just through the earthen berm where we don't have that stone weeper going through it. Again, it's just a solid kind of clay berm with uh, an erosion control blanket on the top of it and it's keyed in so we make sure that the erosion uh, doesn't get at the toe of that berm. And again, a cross section of the earthen berm. This is pretty much the same except we don't have the gabion going through the berm in this section. So this is what the bypass sediment structure looks like. So this inlet would be located close to where the water enters um, that sediment forebay. Water would get into this. We're going to put an inlet filter basket, which is um, a way that we can capture sediment um, right in this structure. This has a bypass mechanism in it to where it can overflow internally. But basically, the water will come into this, this pipe. And then there's a sump in this one and it, it's back pitched to get back out. So there's always going to be water in this system, which provides a mechanism for the sediment to settle out. And again, this structure here, this will have a closed lid on it, and this is going to be located near the easement where the city can come in and, and vacuum that out if, if they need to um, vacuum out the, the sump. Okay, onto the filter strip. Um, this one's a lot more simple than that sediment four bay. Again, this is just um, getting rid of the weeds and the, the um, invasive uh, material that's out there, um, stripping that off, and then getting um, a nice native vegetation established. And again, we're gonna have those uh, um, level spreaders in between and then right at the at the um, tail end of it to make sure that we, we don't get a channel cutting through here and getting an eroded uh, channel. We want that flow to spread out as much as possible because that's what improves the water quality. Again, this is kind of what we expect it to look like. 
So the filter strip, again, will provide pretreatment of the water. Native plants in the dry basin, are there going to be any issues with invasive species, and what's the city going to do to deal with that? Yeah, so these areas certainly will need to be maintained, especially in the first three years, to um, you know come in and, and to treat weeds and to um, you know periodically do a rough mow on it. I don't know, is the city planning on doing um, prescribed burns on this as well or not? Uh, so typically in the first three years, we have a contractor who will come out and um, basically give it a lot more love and attention while the plants are getting established. Um, so, so there's going to be a lot more upfront, upfront maintenance during that establishment period. Um, and then once the plants are established, um, there's a lower level of, there's not no maintenance, but there's a much lower level of maintenance that's required at that point. Um, so I would expect that maintenance to look like burns every three to five years, um, periodic mowing, and then maybe some spot treatment here and there. Does the city do any burning anywhere? Uh, yes, we do. Um, so. So last year we burned at like McKee Farms in some areas, the Schumann Greenway we burned. Um, it, it really just depends on um, what's up in, or what's due to be burned. Um, and the purpose of burning is uh, one, to, to help reduce the weeds, and then also to help with the health of the native vegetation, because native vegetation um, actually thrives when you burn it, so that's helpful. Go ahead. Have bids gone out for that yet? For the burn for the contractor? Um, yes. So actually, uh, the bids went out. Um, the RFP was called Citywide um, Stormwater Maintenance um, RFP, and we got three proposals last week. Um, I have a meeting with the folks who we decided to go forward with. Um, next Monday just to talk about scope and make sure we're on, all on the same page about scope um, and then it's going to go to council for um, approval. So that's where we are on that. But that's for other sites, that's not for this other site. Sites. Yeah, so this one. This was, will get added to the list later on. Once it's right. approved. Yes, yep. once it's established. Yeah. Will it be a combination of seed and plugs or all seed? It's just for establishment period. Sure. So. Um, I'll go into a little bit of that later, especially in the bioretention basin. You know, obviously seed is much um, more economical to get established. Um, in the bioretention area, we will probably look at getting alternate bid requests from contractors for doing a pre-vegetated um, mat. So it's essentially, it's almost like uh, native sod. Um, it, you roll it out and it, it's ready to grow. So um, we're gonna. That's typically fairly expensive to do. It's nice because it's established right away. Um, uh, so we're gonna get prices, and if we have the funding to do that, we'll we'll try some of that. Yeah, and otherwise it's going to be plugs. Yeah, otherwise plugs and seed as well. Right. Yep. In the bioretention area, and then seed in, in the other areas. So part of your plan on on this also is to slow down. The amount of water that's that's flowing through here, correct? Yeah. So if you've ever been down there, when we get heavy uh, heavy rain, thunderstorms and stuff like that, you know, I, people always ask me. I live right across the right across the street um, from Burn Park, and people always ask me where I live. And I said, well, I live in Lake Lake Burnwood. <laughs> I mean, it's it, it, it's yeah. not a pond out there in that in that cornfield. It's a lake. So I'm concerned about, it, it sounds like a good system that's in place and the amount of filtering and hoping seepage going down in and stuff. Um, but I'm still concerned a little bit about the, the pipes that go through there that. Yeah, that's so. The pressure that goes out that other end. Sure. So um, from a water quality perspective and from a, a runoff volume perspective, you're trying to treat the smaller events. You have a lot more runoff, you have many, many frequent small events and you might get a couple large events. So as far as the large, you know, high volume events that you're talking about, um, you know, I don't expect that this is going to change what you see when you have a huge 100 year event. Yeah. Um, this 
will improve that slightly because we're going to get some more infiltration. We'll, um, you know, be losing some water f through the infiltration and evaporation, but the amount of that compared to the volume of runoff that comes through here in a 100-year event is, is dramatically larger. So, um, And I can, I can add to that a little bit. So, so like Corey said, we're really, we're kind of limited to the space that we have. So there's what you would normally do in order to try to reduce that, that rate is make the pond bigger, but we're kind of limited to the size of, of the pond that we currently have. Um, one of the things that we are planning to do is add more riprap rip rip at the downstream end, and that is going to provide some energy dissipation. Um, so, so that's one of the things that we're planning. And then again, with the volume being reduced, that will also reduce the rate to some extent, but probably not appreciably. But from a, a runoff, you know, volume perspective, this will have a significant, you know, benefit, which especially will help things like erosion and, um, you know, the downstream channelization that you see. Um, from our modeling that we've done with this, the runoff volume uh, decreases by uh, around 75 percent. So those smaller events, rather than it trickling out that pond nonstop for a long time, it will soak into the ground instead. Okay, so finally down to the bioretention basin. Um, again, that water is gonna be coming into the basin through uh, the third level spreader, which just makes sure that that flow is dispersed across that entire area. We don't want a channel <clears throat> coming through that area um, where there's all that engineered soil. So Claudia explained this nicely, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, um, but the city has done a lot of um, test pits out there to see where those good infiltration soils are located. So we have a general um, sense as far as how deep we'll need to dig and how much sand we'll need to put back in to make sure that we tie into those um, high infiltration soils. So again, ultimately what we're trying to do here is to encourage that infiltration, um, to treat it uh, with that engineered soil. It's a mix of sand and compost, so it does a nice job of, of cleaning the water as well. And then um, that again will help with that volume of runoff going downstream. So a little bit about the sequence of construction. Um, as you saw, there's kind of three major phases that, that will occur from upstream to downstream. We're going to construct those from the east to the west, and the reason why we're doing that is because if we constructed it from the west to the east, that would be downstream upstream, and we would complete an area and then disturb the area just upstream of it. So all that sediment would go into the area that you just completed. So we're gonna be um, doing the work in phases to allow that upstream area to become stabilized before we work on the next downstream area. And the most important part of that is just protecting that engineered soil and the vegetation within that bioretention basin because we don't wanna have to redo that. So, um, Costs are, you know, we want to make sure that we get this right with the costs. So we're trying to look at options for keeping our costs down so we can get as much benefit as possible. One of the things that we've investigated, um, when we uh, excavate that bioretention base in a lot of those areas, we need to dig down eight to 10 feet deep to get down to that sand layer. So we need to then have a place to take that dirt that we're digging out of the ground and some place to put it. So two options that we're going to look at in this contract, one of them is going to be to haul it off site and dispose of it somewhere off site. The other option that we're looking at is to potentially utilize that on the park property in the burn um, park. And I have a, a slide here coming up. Uh, I guess we'll just go right to it. So the existing park, um, hopefully you can all kind of see where this is at. The pond is on the south right there. So this is just north of, the, of where the pond is located. The existing park has um, a back, uh, baseball backstop um, you, at the top of the, the slide there. But at the s southern end, you can see all of these orange lines. Those are the contours or the shape of the ground. And the closer those are means that they're slope, and the farther away means it's very flat ground. So out on this, the site here, we have very non-uniform slopes. In areas it's two to three percent and then there's areas where it's a half a percent to one percent. 
So this area is very flat and doesn't drain very well. These areas are much more suitable. In general, with a park um, field site like this that doesn't have under drains on it, you want to have uh, between a 2 and a 3 percent slope. So what we're looking at is using that excess material from the bioretention area and filling this to create that more uniform slope. And if you go to the next slide, we're going to fill that in to create that uniform. We made it at a 2.5 percent slope. So it allows us a beneficial way to use that material and then to create a better park site at the same time. So that whole um, item will be discussed at the Park Commission um, meeting on March 5th at 7 o'clock. So we're going to talk, talk to the Park Commission and see if they're on board with that idea. Um, we really see it as a win-win. It enables this project to be done um, for less uh, money and it also enables us to improve the park site at the same time. Yep. Uh, did you ever discuss putting it where the pine trees are on the back end of that property along where the property line is? There's a grove of pine trees that go up in the back. Just another spot is all I'm thinking. Right. Yeah. The, um, you know, that area is kind of where all of the, the drainage off the field comes. So if we build that up too much, that area won't drain. So um, plus, um, you know, we're open to, you know, discussing wherever the Park Commission, you know, would see it the most benefit. From a, a park playability perspective, this was a place that, that we would suggest just because it helps address the drainage issue. Take up all the material that you're going to dig up. I don't know if that's enough. Um, yeah, we've done earthwork calculations on this and the balance is very close, how much we're digging out versus how much we're putting in here. Terry, what was it they used to do down there? Didn't the kids used to play like soccer or something? They had big nets that set up in that very flat area? Yeah. Hadn't seen them in years, but when we first yeah. moved here, that was a regular thing. Right. Yeah, and this will still be very playable as much as, you know, it looks like a big hillside. That's a two and a half percent slope. I mean, that's very flat. I mean, um, that will make it so it drains nicely, but it's still a very nice soccer field. You yeah. mentioned rip crap. Uh, is that downstream of the retention pond? So I was wondering, is there going to be like a waterway or something installed there for what's exiting? Sorry, I'm going to go back to a lot of way far. Yeah, so. At the outlet, this is probably the best one. So yes, downstream of the existing outlet, again, we're not going to modify this, but there is some erosion down here, so we are looking at adding riprap to the outfall. There will also be a little bit of riprap on the inside here um, where the water goes from the bioretention basin into here because we want to make sure that the engineered soil doesn't wash out and out the pipe and go downstream. I have to look at it closer maybe when the snow is gone, but it seems like that needs to have like a grass waterway or something after to get it to drain properly away from the rest of the field, doesn't it? That's a plug-in right there. The outlet. It's only for a hundred year rain or something like that. Would that ever even work? So any any water that goes through the system would go out that outlet because the pipe is actually at the very bottom. So so that's why it's a dry pond because it allows all of the water to go through. So um, so it would be any storm event that doesn't infiltrate will exit this this area as it is today. And as far as the downstream, uh, you know, the, the riprap will have to be excavated in and, and placed um, so it doesn't block the flow. But we're not looking at, you know, regrading a new channel downstream or anything. We just want to make sure that the water coming out of the pipe isn't, you know, eroding um, at the toe of the berm. Okay, so that brings us to the next steps and timeline. Um, did you want me to go through this? or did yeah, Sure. <clears throat> okay, so... Uh, today, we have the public meeting here today. Um, as I mentioned, we're planning on going to the Park Commission on it's Thursday, March 5th. And then after the Parks Commission meeting, we're going to incorporate any comments that they have um, into our um, plans. 
and then we plan on putting the project out to bid on Wednesday, March 11th. Um, having those bids return and due back on April 3rd. And then we go through the process of um, getting approval through council. As Claudia mentioned, it will require a budget amendment. So on Tuesday, April 28th, that would go through council to which um, two thirds of the council would need to approve um, that budget amendment to allow that full contract amount to be spent. Um, and then finalizing, you know, signing all of the contract documents and then um, ultimately having a pre-construction meeting and, and starting construction in early May. Um, so that's kind of, uh, again, the, the start date would be dependent on, you know, the contractor and weather and things like that, but um, we're actually looking to get this project uh, uh, under construction pretty quickly here. On that 28th, that's on uh, that budget amendment, that's once you've acquired your Dane County Yes, yes, <laughs> and and we wouldn't we wouldn't sign a contract with someone right. saying we're going to pay that right. amount until we get that final paperwork. Definitely. And is the RFP for the contractor? Are they working with the three hundred sixty-four thousand, or is it a subset of that? So the way that works is we would put out to bid what we want them to construct and then they would tell us how much it's going to cost and then we would go with the lowest bidder. Um, but we've done an engineering estimate ahead of time so we have an idea of how much we expect people to put in their bids for. So um, I think our goal was actually 300k for the engineer's estimate just to be conservative. <laughs> um, and then once we get that in, uh, we'll move forward. What if you only get one bid like last year? Yeah. If we only get one bid like last year, I am going to push to open that bid. <laughs> but we shovel out. But we do I do think this is a much better time of year to put the bids out. Um, and that's why we really wanted to, you know, have this public meeting before we even had the Dane County grant in hand because that timing is so imperative to get that out on the street. Last year we, you know, weren't able to put it out until later in the year. And I think that was like one of the main reasons why we only got one bid. So this year, um, we're much ho more hopeful with this timeline that we'll get some good bids. It seems like you had like 150,000, 2017, 18, 19, now we're in 2020, that 150 is going up as costs go up. That's true. Um, it's sad. Is there a plan B where if the bid comes in over budget where you can come in and just do a scratch pond water reservoir versus all this other stuff to get it done within a year versus losing out on grants and putting this off another year i mean this has been going on for a long time yeah yeah and like claudia said that's why we we're trying to you know design something that we think is going to be buildable f for the budget that we have. So we've built in a little bit of contingency on that side. We're also bu building in some alternates into the bid as well. So if the bids come in high, we'll be able to scale back the buyer retention slightly to fit within our budget so we can still construct. Um, but we are very hopeful that um, we're designing something within the budget that we have. And like Claudia had mentioned, my firm bids a, a lot of projects and the time when, when the, the last bid was going was a horrible time to bid. The contractors were extremely busy and the bids were insanely high if you wanted something done quickly. Um, like Claudia had mentioned, when, when you're bidding you know, early in the season, um, you're gonna get a lot more interest, so you'll get more bidders, you'll get more competition, and you'll get a lower price. So uh, I'm hopeful that we'll be in a much better position and we will be constructing uh, early in the spring. I would imagine keeping the soil on site's got to be huge because it wasn't that the big, that's a huge number to move soil. So, yeah, and pushing and that's got to be big. Claudia and I worked on, on Hillside Heights, which is an, another stormwater project in the city, and, and we did the same thing. We reused the, the, the excavated material on a park site on that job, and I think that, that worked out very well for costs and for the park. And it's for sure the lowest bid that 
when you factor other the methods, or is it just always the lowest bid? When it's the lowest responsible bidder. So as as long as there isn't uh, an obvious reason to disqualify a bidder, the statutes require the lowest responsible bidder for public works construction. Okay. Any other I think questions? That was it. Yeah. yeah. What about the, um, to get rid of all the seed base with all the invasives, you know, there's a lot of them out there. Um, mostly where the reed canary grass should be digging that out. But um, are you going to treat with uh, something or, because if you just scrape the top off, you'll just expose a whole other seed bank layer. Right, yeah, we, um, we are planning on, you know, scraping off that topsoil layer and likely importing new topsoil. Um, We'll have to see what's in the seed bank, I think. Um, I have had other projects where we did an herbicide treatment to basically mm -hmm. completely kill off everything so, you, you know, you're not starting with a, a, a weed, um, you know, seed bank that comes up with your natives. Um, so, yeah, that's definitely something that we'll be talking about. Adding the soil to the park, what will that do to the park? I mean, will that encourage invasive or... Oh. They mow. Yeah, that's that's a mowed turf grass field. So you know, will there be you know more weeds in the first couple of years? Probably, but with mowing that, I mean, a lot of it is weeds uh, it's now. All it's all dandelions it's now. Yeah. It's not like it's. Yeah, it's it's, it is. It's yeah. all. Trust me, those that live across from the park, we get those dandelions. <laughs> <laughs> So it would be reseeded in turf grass, but I would expect that it would look very similar to the rest of the park in a couple of years. Okay, well thank you all for coming. Yeah, we're excited to get it, get it constructed. Definitely. I like it. Well, thank you everyone for coming out. there with their lawn chairs and work. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I have three new